This is Dr. Peter S. Ruckman, founder and president of the Pensacola Bible Institute in Pensacola, Florida. I encourage you to preach on the street. If you preach on the street at all, you're going to get a lot of criticism for it from Christians. Do you know why that is? Because every major preacher in that Bible in both Testaments is a street preacher. Do you realize Jesus Christ never preached in a church building in his life? He was an outdoor preacher his whole life. There weren't any churches in the New Testament until 200 A.D., and that's long after Christ had gone back to glory and long after Paul was dead. All apostles were street preachers. Both Testaments, Jeremiah the prophet on the street, Isaiah preaching on the street, Moses outdoors, never in any building. He's out in the street this whole ministry, and the temple hasn't been built while he's coming up. Where do you think he's preaching then? Out on the street. That's why your modern Christian hates preaching on the street, because it's biblical. And the average Christian you're going to run into today is going to say, well, you're just turning people away from Christ. You're going to win more people by loving him, you know, than by getting and yelling at them. That's what they'll say. In plain words, both testaments don't mean anything to them if it's going to cost them something. They won't take it because they don't have the guts. So they're going to throw out both testaments and then pretend to be real concerned about people's souls. That's the America you're living in. I want to encourage you to get to preach on the street any way you can, every time you get an opportunity, any time you're able to do it, and make an opportunity if you don't have one. And I'll guarantee you God will bless it and God will use it. And he said the word that goes out of his mouth will not return to him, but will accomplish the purpose that he's going to send it to. You've got a living word and it's alive and it'll go out long after you've spoken it and stick with the person that heard it. And that's the one thing the devil doesn't want. He doesn't want the gospel out where people can hear it. He knows they're going to avoid the churches. He knows they're going to run from it in school because they don't put the Bible in the school. But out in the street, he can't stop it unless he gets you off the street. And in so doing, he denies the ministry of Paul and Jesus Christ and all the apostles. They were all street preachers. This is Dr. Peter S. Ruckman. And you- Open the question. Let anybody ask any question they want to ask about anything about a King James Bible. And we're going to do this. We're going to let the red and blues here ask a question, and somebody else, and then back to red and blues, because I want the I want the students to participate in this, as well as our visitors here today. So we'll take the one from the visitors, and then one from the school, and don't have to any preparation. Cold turkey, hit it on the wing. And uh, we'll try to answer any question you ask in five seconds or less. Now, uh, I may not be able to give you all the references in five seconds or less, but I'll give you the first one. And the sky is the limit. Any question is legitimate. Okay? I mean, the book is, after all, is the book. you will all be able to handle anything we've got here. Father, we ask your blessing upon our meeting now. May the Holy Spirit guide and lead us to all truth for Jesus' sake. Amen. All right, who will be first? Raise your hand, shoot. Yes, sir. All right, that passes in Second Samuel he's quoting there. And go back to Second Samuel where David is uh, attacking uh, Jerusalem and is going to get the uh, city of Jerusalem from the Jebusites. Uh, this will be Second uh, Samuel chapter, what, about 7, 6, 5. All right, 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 8. 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 8. And David said on that day, Whosoever get it up to the gutter, and that'll be the place the water comes down, like a, any gutter, their rain spout, the water came down, went down inside the city, and came out under kind of an underground uh, viaduct. Whoever get it up to the gutter, that he climbs up inside the drain pipe, and smites the Jebusite and the lame and the blind that are hated of David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. Wherefore they said, The blind and lame shall not come into the house. Now the answer for that is found in verse 6. The king and his men went to Jerusalem, the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, which spake to David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come hither, thinking David cannot come in hither. So the way that thing worked was, when they came up to attack the city, they said, uh, We're going to attack you and get you. And the folks up in the wall made fun of them. And the ones up in the wall said, you can't take this place and you get rid- unless you get rid of those lame and blind folks you got. They didn't have any lame and blind folks. That's sarcasm. They're making fun of them. They're implying that David's troops are lame and blind. 
And so when David says what he says in verse 8, he can either be taking him at their word or not. Now, they have a, they have a, they have a, a word for this in English grammar, which I don't know because my grammar is pretty atrocious. But do you remember one time when Jesus Christ came back and said to one of his servants, What would you do with the money? And the servant said, I knew the power to hard and austere man, therefore I hid the money. You know what the Lord answered him? He didn't say, I'm not a hard and austere man. He said, Okay, if you knew I was, then how come you didn't do this? See, the Lord took the fellow's words out of his mouth to be so, even though they weren't. Well, that's the case you have here. And David says here, he says, Because they said the lame and blind shall not come into the house. Then David said, Okay, whoever goes up there and smites the lame and blind in their outfit, I'll make him the chief captain. So he's just taking them at their word. He's being sarcastic. All right, something else. One of the students now, any one of you, raise a hand, shoot, anything. Don't make a difference. Don't worry about your intelligence. <laughs> the way to find out something is ask. The fellow said, that if ignorance is bliss, I'm a blizzard. <laughs> <laughs> one of you students, you got anything you want to ask? You know nothing you want to ask? Curiosity satisfied, huh? And everything? you got a sneaking suspicion that isn't going to go your way anyway. <laughs> man said one time, he said, the reason why I met against the Bible is because it's against them. But the Bible got some blessings in it, too. All right, over here. First Thessalonians 2, 2. The, the, First Thessalonians 2, 2. The day of Christ has been changed, the day of the Lord in the New Translations. Because when these, uh, when these uh, babies get a hold of something they understand, they're so anxious to let you know it that they change the Bible to let you know it. Now, these fellows knew the day referred to here in the Second Thessalonians 2, 2 was the day of the Lord, so they just changed it to the day of the Lord. Now, by changing it to the day of the Lord, they uh, made a little uh, slam to the deity of Christ. Because as your King James text stands, if it says the day of Christ is at hand, that is telling you that Christ in the New Testament is the Lord of the Old Testament. Because the expression, the day of the Lord, occurs over and over again in the New Testament. Therefore, if you get in the New Testament read the day of Christ, that identifies Christ as the Lord of the Old Testament. So it's a slap to cover up the deity of Jesus Christ. Let me show you a place just like it, so you'll understand interpretation, on the Holy Ghost. They didn't change this one, but if they, if they had been able to, they would have. Turn to the book of Acts for a minute. And let me show you a place where the King James Bible uses a word instead of Lord in order to show you the deity of the three persons of the Trinity. And we'll get this uh, uh, Acts chapter 21, verse 11. Instead of the day of the Lord, the day of Christ, to show that Christ has replaced the Lord in the Old Testament. And now in Acts 21, 11, look how this expression is used. Acts 21, 11, And when he was come to us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost. What's that expression in the Old Testament? Thus saith the Lord. See that thing right there? So that's the verse to show you the Holy Ghost is Lord and Christ is Lord. Therefore, the change is a blasphemous attack on the deity of Jesus Christ, as all the new Bibles do. I want you students. You got something for us yet? Yes, sir. How do you disprove evolution? No, I turn to uh, Matthew 11. Make, make it Mark. Mark's even better. The best way to do it, if you're dealing with somebody that believes in it, trying to give you a hard time, is duck out under the back fence and, uh, and leave the argument between them and the Lord. And you put, up a, you put a man up against Jesus Christ, and he usually thinks twice before he uh, tries to make a liar out of him, although some of them will still do it even then. But get Mark 13. Get Mark 13 in one hand and get Matthew chapter 19 in the other. Now, the way to do it is make the issue between him and Jesus Christ. Don't let him argue with you. And here's the way you do it. You get Mark chapter 13 in one hand and Matthew 9 in the other, and here's what you quote to him or let him see. It's even better to show it to him. Although you'll find most evolutionists and infidels will not sit down very long with you at a table with a Bible. Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> Did you know if you get a fellow to sit down at a table with an open Bible with you for 35 minutes, you'll lead him to Christ, or he'll get so embarrassed he'll get up and leave and apologize for his infidelity. But the trick is to make the guy sit down for 30 minutes with an open Bible. They won't do it. They won't do it. All right, now, first of all, Matthew 19, uh, Matthew 19, verse 4, Jesus speaking. Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? 
Now, Christ said when the first man and woman were made, they were made male and female. That doesn't match an amoeba. An amoeba has no sex. You can't get female and male out of an amoeba. If evolution is true, you had a one-cell animal, an amoeba, that became a two-cell animal, which is a joke. There are no two-cell animals. Which became a three- or four-cell animal, which is another joke. There are no three- and four-cell animals. I mean, the whole thing is a joke. When they talk to you about the missing link, they kind of make you think the missing link is between the anthropoids and man. That isn't true. There are 33,000 missing links. And the first 10 are between the amoeba and the next thing near to it. There are no two-cell animals anywhere. So when you start going to an amoeba, to a paramecium, to a hydra, to a planaria, to a jellyfish, and then, you know, once there was a you know, tadpole with my tail tucked in, you know, and what kind of business? When I, when I was a frog, when I began to begin, that was a tadpole with my tail tucked in, and next I was a monkey in a banyan tree, and now I'm a doctor with a Ph.D. <laughs> and when you get going on that kind of stuff there, you're not coming across one missing link, you're coming across 33,000 missing links. Now, Christ said that he that made him at the beginning made the male and female. Well, then the sexes begin with the first man and woman, male and female. Well, if they came from a monkey, that's stupid. There are sexes among monkeys. And if monkeys came from a possum, they came from a orangutan, and they came from a lemur, and they came from a whale that came up on the beach and went back in the water or something, that whale's a backslider. The greatest argument against evolution is a whale. A whale's a mammal. What's he doing in the water? That's wild, man. <laughs> I mean, how does this fish come out of the, on the land, learn how to bear young like a cow or a, or a cat or a horse or a dog, and suckle its young like a mammal, and then goes back in the water? Wouldn't all the kids drown? <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, all right, he says he made a male and female to start with. All right, now that's Jesus. Now, here's a stronger one. Mark chapter 13, verse 19. For in those days shall be affliction such as was not from the beginning of the creation, which God created. Jesus Christ is a creationist. He's not an evolutionist. So you ask your fellow, if you believe in that, say, what do you think about Jesus Christ? You'll talk a while, and you show in the past that Jesus Christ was a creationist. Should I believe you or him? Put the guy on the spot. Say, should I believe you or him? All right, something else. Yes, sir. No, I'll get Genesis 1 in one hand and get uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 in the other. Uh, you know, many times in Christian school, when they got nothing to do but sit around and shoot the bull, they have got all these kind of problems, and they all get busy writing about them. And the big thing these days is the gap theory, the gap theory. They publish all the kind of pamphlets. Hebrew scholar says this, and this one says that, and so and so thinks this, and so and so thinks that. Don't amount to hill of being to start with. Or I get Genesis 1 in one hand and Second Peter chapter 3 in the other, and notice there's no such thing as a gap theory. There's a gap fact, <laughs> but it isn't a theory. All right, uh, Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, period. Well, if the Lord makes something, he makes it right. You never knew the Lord to do anything at the beginning that was wrong, did you? I mean, your Christian life began, the Lord gave you a new birth. When the Lord begins something, it's always right. When he made the man and the woman, Genesis 2, they were made right. See? When the Lord begins something, it is never begun wrong. You can't say it was begun, the formless and void. That's nonsense. God never begins anything that way. I mean, the history of the universe, uh, people, is the history of a thing starting right and running down. It ain't the history of something starting form and voidless, void and formless, and then building up. You know, one time I got into Michigan University State, something at Jackson or someplace near, I forget whether to have it, but somebody got me into a humanities class at the University of Michigan or State, Michigan or something. And I get in there where there was a hippie professor sitting cross-legged on the desk with his mustache and his beard. Wildest scene you ever saw in your life, man. And somebody got me there, you know, under tolerance and being broad-minded and hearing everybody's religion. And I had me a ball. I went for 50 minutes, and I had that class so soaked up when the bell rang, they didn't leave the classroom. And they all stayed another hour with the other class coming in. And when that hour was over, they still didn't want to go. And that thing went two and a half hours. Now, I'll show you what it did. I mean, I pull a dirty trick on them as a fella can pull, but <laughs> if you get a chance, pull this one off. I said this. I said, now, boys and girls, there's uh, three ways. 
You see, the first rule of public speaking is never talk down to your audience, you see. I mean, some of you sapheads don't understand that, so I'll tell you that. And so, and so, <laughs> so I said, boys and girls, there are three ways you can look at life. Now, Darwin said it always has been there, and it is going up slowly all the time. I said, so much for Darwin, Haeckel, Lenin, Trotsky, Engels, Marx, and the Communist Party, right? Yeah. Sure, man, that's all there is to that. So much for that. You don't have to go to college four years to get that. That's all there is to it right there, see it? <laughs> and I said, then there's another way of looking at it, like Spengler and the rest of them, and that is that although history is going up, it repeats itself. So sometimes it appears you're going backwards, when actually you're going forward. And sometimes it appears you're going down, though eventually you will go up. <laughs> That's the second way to look at it. Now, after World War II, everybody got rid of Leibniz and Spinoza and Hegel and Nietzsche and Carlyle and Tupel Drake and Hemingway and the rest of them, and they came out with existentialism, and that's Kierkegaard and all that bunch, and Sartre and the rest of them. And because Einstein said direction is relative, and motion is relative, and time is relative, there's no fixed point for nothing. <laughs> so you can't say you're going up because you don't know which direction is up, Right? I mean, the school, New School Field Bible says up isn't up in the second Corinthians chapter 12. Since there's no time, you can't say whether you're going to backward or forward, no direction, you can't say whether you're going up or down. And since there's no moral standards, you can't tell whether you're getting better or getting worse. You see, Einstein's theory of relativity reduces you to an animal because it gives you no standards. So if you follow that philosophy, it is true that you may be going forward, but then again, you might be going backward. And then again, sometimes you think you're going backward, you're going forward. But there's one thing for certain, that the only thing that is true is that at any one point, you're there. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, man. And you know something? And you know something? That's how all these kids got on the drugs. The kid got existential. He said, the only thing that's real is what's going on right now. See? The happening. See? The now. The experience. You see? And I taught you kids that because since you don't know where you're from and you don't know where you're going, then the only thing is right this minute. See that? That reduces the, animal, the level of a dog or a cat. So I said, now the Bible says it this way. Amen. You start at the top and you go along and Adam mess up and you drop. And God picks you up and you drop and God drowns you out to start over again with Abraham. And Abraham goes down to Egypt and God pulls him out with Moses and they go into the prophecy and God pulls him out with David. They're going to prosper in the Solomon. God pulls them out of Jesus Christ, and then his church age during the prophecy. Any questions? <laughs> now, when you put that on them, you know what happens? Not one kid there will ask any question about his college education. Every kid in that room, whether he's a Ph.D., an M.A., or a freshman, wants to know about this one. Because this one is different than those. See? So he starts. And up started those hands. Well, what's that out of mean? What do you mean, Abraham? Well, how'd they get out? What's the tribulation? What's the rapture? Boy, did I have me a ball, man. I taught Bible in that place for two and a half hours. Amen. And right in the middle of that class, that humanity professor said, I see that you represent the southern brand of fundamentalism. <laughs> and I said, that's right, it's a minority group. Don't knock it. <laughs> You bet your life, some of you tolerant Yankees. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a, a wild thing happened in that class. We were going through something there about the, about the crucifixion or something, and there was one lady in that class. She's about 40 years old. Nice dressed lady. Looked completely out of place. Just out of place, man, in a tuxedo and a grease pit. And, I mean, she was sitting there. She must have been some 40-year-old woman trying to finish her education and maybe a widow or something, neatly dressed, you know, and just in, in impeccable and just quiet and a nice, you know, a nice, healthy, clean-looking face, you know. And we got some place in the argument where they're all asking a bunch of questions, and I was trying to explain things without dropping the bomb just yet, you know, because uh, I wanted to, you know, to get them in real deep before I dropped the bomb on them. And when everybody was trying to say, what do you mean, what do you explain, how do you mean, that lady raised her hand, <laughs> and I said, yes. She said, just as, I mean, just as innocently as a, as a sheep in the middle of a, a wolf bin, <laughs> she said, well, isn't what you're trying to say is the blood of Jesus Christ cleans us from all sin? I said, yeah, I said. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, man. What a, what a. <laughs> you 
You talk about you talk about out of the mouths of babe and the suckling, thou hast perfected praise. My land. I mean, I had to turn my head to keep them laughing. I was about to split, man, of that thing. <laughs> but now, anyway, when God begins it, it begins right, you see, and then it goes down. The history in the Bible, well, you ought to know it by your own life. I mean, you're born, and when you're born, you have life. And then your life goes like this. And then it begins to go like this. And it reaches a peak, and then it drops off like that. Everybody's life goes that way. You know why it goes that way? Because that's how the book of Revelation laid out. You get that thing started in the church age, in Revelation chapter 2, and it goes like this. And then there's a revival in there in Philadelphia church period, Laodicea, down like that, see? So that's the way life is. Life goes along to about 40 or 50 or 60 at the most, and then there's a sudden drop off. Now, if you know that so, you know that's how history has to be. I mean, the God of the Bible is a God of history. So you know when God made that thing in Genesis 1-1, it couldn't have been void and formless no matter who said what. I mean, if the guy could prove it from the Hebrew, it would be a lie. Now, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, what happened? Let's watch it now carefully. And the earth was without form and void and darkness upon the face of the deep. Now, watch while they stop right there. Look what we'll hit if we go a little further. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the what? Water. What? Water. Louder. Water. There you go. I wonder how come they don't ever discuss that. What's water doing there? Okay, Second Peter chapter 3, verse 4. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 4. Now, nothing like a King James Bible occurred at the seminary education. Second Peter chapter 4, or 3, chapter 3, verse 4. Chapter 3, 4, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, watch it, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Genesis 1, 1. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens, plural, were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. <laughs> out of the water and in the water. That isn't a reference to Noah's flood. It's that Christian Research Foundation out in California by Henry Morris that made you think that was Noah's flood. That isn't Noah's flood. That's the beginning of the creation. It's what you read. All right, he said, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished, for there's no rain in verse 5 and 6. Like in the days of Noah, there's no rain at all. This earth was drowned in Genesis 1 2. And there isn't any theory to it. Now, let me show you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to compare Scripture to Scripture. I'll show you the difference between uh, Bible theology or Bible scholarship and Christian scholarship. And there's a big difference. Oh, here comes Adam. The Lord says to Adam, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. If you have a new Schofield Bible, the word replenish will be knocked out. Or if you have a new ASV. If you have any Bible but a King James Bible, you can no longer find the truth. Now, you can find eight or nine truths. But the Bible said, ever learning and yet never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. All right, there's that. Be proof of the fire from the earth. Up shows a man named Noah. And the Lord says to Noah in Genesis chapter 9, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Doesn't it strike you kind of funny? The Lord should tell those two men the same thing. Well, we'll say it for natural, okay. Okay, this man has three sons, that man has three sons. Doesn't that strike you as kind of funny? After he told them both the same thing? You know, he told this fellow here, had dominion over the, the fishes of the sea, fowls of the air, beasts of the earth. You know what the Lord told Noah? Told him the same thing. Probably just an accident. Okay, see this fellow right here? He was naked when he sinned. You see this fellow right there? He was naked when he sinned. You reckon that's an accident? Let's see. This fellow had one son, his name was Cain. Curse to Mexico. One son, Ham. Curse to Mexico. One son, Abel. Type of Christ. One son, Shem. Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. One fellow over here, Seth. One fellow over here, Jacob. How do you explain that? I mean, how come there's so many similar things? Do you know God told this fellow out to eat something? You know what God told that fellow in Genesis 9? 
He told them not to eat some. The life of the flesh and the blood thereof, thou shalt not eat. Now, how do you explain that? We're not anywhere near it yet. This fellow here was told, don't eat it. This fellow here was, don't eat it. This fellow here took something he shouldn't have taken. It was from a vine tree. But whatever that bird took, it sure wasn't an apple. And it wasn't a pear on the ground. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> and, uh, I have all kinds of jokes about the Bible. You know, Noah's wife is Joan of Arc. You know. All right, now take, you take Noah. Now you take Noah. He was naked, took something he shouldn't take. Naked, took something he shouldn't take. Curse connect with his seed. Curse connect with his seed. Replenish, replenish. Well, what happened right before God told Noah that? Why, there was a flood. So what happened right before God told Adam that? Why, it couldn't be anything else possible. There isn't any question about it. There never has been a gap theory. That's just scholastic baloney. And it's cut off for suckers. <laughs> Cold cuts. <laughs> <laughs> amen, 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 amen. <laughs> You get talking like this, and people say, oh, Ruckman thinks he's right and everybody else is wrong. You're a foot. you got a Bible there in your hand, don't you? you got a Bible? Do you believe it? Amen. No, just give me this stuff, Ruckman, Ruckman, Ruckman. I didn't write that book. You blame it on me. You blame it on the Lord. I get blamed for a lot of things the Lord is guilty of. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Something else. Yes, sir. Solomon had his half-mother killed. Half-brother killed. Would that be Adonijah? Uh-huh. Okay, uh, First Kings. Uh, it'll be First Kings, uh, First Kings chapter, First Kings chapter 1, verse 42. First Kings chapter 1, 42. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 1 verse 40, uh, 1 Kings chapter 1 verse 41 and 42, and Adonijah and all the guests were with him, heard it as they had made an end of eating, and when Joab heard the sound of the trumpet, he said, Wherefore is the uproar in the city? And in comes a fellow and tells him, and uh, what's going on? And when he tells him what's going on, verse 49, all the guests were with Adonijah, were afraid, and rose up and went every man his way. And Adonijah feared because of Solomon, and rose and went and caught hold in the horn of the altar. So to begin with, Adonijah, Solomon's half-brother, is engaged in a revolution to overthrow the, the throne. He's, engaged, he's got Joab and they're out to overthrow the government and usurp the throne. 51, it was told Solomon, saying, Behold, Adonijah feareth King Solomon, for lo, he hath caught hold in the horns of the altar. 52, and Solomon said, and here it comes, If, there's a condition, If he will show himself a worthy man, there shall a hair of him fall to the earth, but if, conditional, Wickedness shall be found in him, he shall die. So Adonijah is spared on a condition, and he's spared in the condition that he prove himself a good man and that he's not out to get the throne. So what does Adonijah do? Chapter 2, verse 13. 2, 13, And Adonijah, the son of Haggith, came to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, and she said, Comest thou peaceably? And he said, Peaceably. He said, Moreover, I have somewhat to say to thee. And she said, Say on. And he said, Thou knowest the kingdom was mine, Still got that thing working, that thing, see? You know it belonged to me. And they're always run their faces on me. Something eating him out? But I should reign. Eating him out? Howbeit the kingdom has turned about and has become my brother's, for it was his from the Lord. Little pious enclosure. And now I ask one petition of thee, deny me not. And she said to him, Say on. And he said, Speak, I pray thee to Solomon the king, for he will not say thee nay, that he give Abishag the Shunammite to wife. Now the one he wants to be his wife was one of David's wives. Go back in chapter uh, 1 and look at verse 3. Chapter 1, 3. He wants to marry David's widow. Now, why would he want to do that? Why, David was the king. That fellow's trying to get back in line with the throne. All right, First Kings chapter 2, verse 19. Bathsheba therefore went to King Solomon to speak to him for Adonijah. Verse 22. And King Solomon answered and said to his mother, And why dost thou ask Abishag the Shunammite for Adonijah? Ask for him the kingdom also, for he is mine elder brother, even for him and for Abiathar, rebel, and Joab, a rebel. And then he said he spoke it against his life, had him killed. 
He had him killed because he didn't prove himself a worthy man. He proved that wickedness was in him. All right, one of the students. One of the students. Anything now, shoot. Anything on your mind. You know, while you wait for a question, I'll give you something good to give an evolutionist. This is real. This is real profound, man. This is this hard beat. You ask him this, you say, uh, what's this whole mess doing here anyway? And he says, uh, what do you mean? He says, this thing. Here you are. You're sitting here in a building, you know, out in the sky and sun and moon. How did it all get here? Here's evolution. You say, okay, one, it had to come from nothing naturally, or two, it had to come from nothing supernaturally, or three, it always had to been here, or four, it ain't here, you just think it's there. Now, 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 that doesn't sound like much, but you know something? Did you know those are the only four possibilities, and there's nobody in this building that can give me a fourth possibility? What do you think about that? The only four ways is whatever it is could have got here. The only four, the, the only four shots in that thing. Either it always has been here, see, it always has been here, or else it came out of nothing, or else God created it, or else it ain't here. See? Now, there are no other possibilities. Now, right, you look at those things. Anytime your scientific friends give you a hard time, if it always has been here, that is against the second law of thermodynamics which every physicist in the world believes in. Every physicist in the world believes there's entropy in a closed system, which means that with the passage of time and energy, things tend to a state of randomness and get more and more disorganized till they fall apart. That's the second law of thermodynamics. You want plain language? A clock don't run up, it runs down. You ever notice that? There's a clock in this building running up. <laughs> See? <laughs> They're running down. All right, if it has always been here, that can't be, because if it's always been here, it'd have fallen to pieces 20 billion years ago, because the law of thermodynamics would catch up with the thing and it all fallen apart. All right, and the next thing is, can it come out of nothing? That violates the first law of thermodynamics. There isn't any physicist in America that believes that you can make something out of nothing. Whatever you make it out of is already here. The first law of thermodynamics says you can't create or destroy matter. You can turn it into energy, you can convert energy into matter, matter to energy, and expend energy to energy, but you can't get rid of anything, and you can't create nothing. So one, if you're scientific, it hasn't always been here. Two, if you're scientific, it didn't come out of nothing. And if you don't believe those, you're not a scientist. The fact that you've got 30 years of education, work with science, doesn't mean anything. It means you're, <laughs> you're cuckoo, <laughs> because the two laws of thermodynamics forbid it from being here always and coming out of nothing. You've got two alternatives. Over here, God made it out of nothing. See, that doesn't violate one law over here. See, that's supernatural, or else it isn't here. <laughs> and if it isn't here, then you're living in a nightmare, nothing makes sense. And the people who believe that are in insane asylums. All right, let's have something else. Yes, sir. Yes. All right, that's ten. That's ten for chariot. Uh, the turn to Second Samuel. This is a famous one, and I get letters on it very often from. Uh, people in Christian schools are being harassed by their professors. Second <laughs> uh, Samuel chapter eight. Get Second Samuel chapter eight in one hand, and this is supposed to contradict First uh, Chronicles chapter First Chronicles chapter nine, or uh, First Chronicles chapter nineteen in the other. First Chronicles nineteen. First Chronicles nineteen. First Chronicles nineteen and Second Samuel chapter. Uh, Nine. Let's see. Eight. Excuse me. Eight. Let me look at something right here. Seven hundred horsemen. Seven thousand. Four thousand. Four thousand twenty. What is it? Yeah, that's what I'm looking at. But I, I see something else here. I'll make sure I got the right verse. Uh, no, that's not the right verse. In. Chronicles. Oh. What's that? <laughs> I, 
Yeah, but I've already given you the references. <laughs> okay, uh, First Chronicles 19, uh, First Chronicles 19, verse uh, 18, and uh, Second Samuel chapter 8, verse 4. I think those are the two that match. Uh, I've got to be careful here. Uh, there's another passage just like it. Yeah, it isn't there. It's, it's 2 Samuel 10, 18. 2 Samuel 10, 18. I thought that thing didn't look right with those footmen. Uh, 2 Samuel 10, 18 with 1 Chronicles 19, 18. Yeah. All right, 1 Chronicles 19, 18. The Syrians fled before Israel, and David slew of the Syrians, 7,000 men which fought in chariots, 40,000 footmen, and killed Shophak, the captain of the host. Now, 2 Samuel 10, verse 18. And the Syrians fled before Israel, and David slew the men of 700 chariots, the Syrians, and 40,000 horsemen, and smote Shophak, the captain of the host, who died there. Now, those are the two. By right, one account says in 10, 18, he slew the men, uh, the men of 700 chariots, the Syrians, and 40,000 horsemen. The other says in 1 Chronicles 19, 18, David slew the Syrians 7,000. So one place said 700, the other place said 7,000. 700, 7,000. Now, the way that thing works is each chariot has ten spare horses. And the only way you can find that out is by comparing the Scripture with Scripture on Solomon's stables. Uh, get your text and turn to Second uh, Chronicles on Solomon's stables and get Second uh, Chronicles chapter... Oh, I think we'll time on this one. I well, to have these references marked, but I don't. Uh, second, uh, second Chronicles chapter uh, eight. Ish Denka. Elisha Nish. No, it's uh, nine. Get Second Chronicles nine in one hand, and get uh, First Chronicles or First Kings. Second Chronicles nine in one hand. And First Kings, uh, let's see. Uh, four and the other. I right, get First Kings four and Second Chronicles nine. Now watch how these things are laid out. Second Chronicles nine. Second Chronicles nine twenty five. Second Chronicles nine twenty five. And Solomon had four thousand stalls for horses and chariots and twelve thousand horsemen. Now, 1 Kings 4, 26. And Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots. See that? Each chariot has 10 spares. So often what looks like a contradiction in the King James Bible is not a contradiction at all. It's just the Lord making a fool out of a critical scholar, which is very common. All right, something else. Yes, sir. All right, uh, Judges, turn to Judges on uh, Jephthah, and get, uh, oh, Judges chapter, Judges chapter 10, no, 11, Judges 11. Judges 11. Now, what has happened here is Jephthah has made a vow to the Lord, and Judges chapter 11, when he makes this vow, he makes the vow in verse 30 and 31, Judges 11, 30 and 31. And Jephthah vowed a vow to the Lord, and said, If thou shalt fail, without fail, deliver the children of Ammon into mine hands, then it shall be the word whosoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the children of Ammon, shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. Now when he says that, he has in mind, on the doors of his house, he has in mind not just the front door of the house itself, but the yard and the gate and whatever he has in his household. And uh, this is apparent by the fact that uh, when he comes to his house, verse 34, uh, they come outside and meet him before he ever gets there. Jephthah has in mind a rooster or a lamb or a sheep or a cow or so forth and so on. He doesn't have in mind his, his children. Uh, when he comes home, in verse 34, it says, Jephthah came to Mizpah to his house, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dancers. And she was his only child. Beside her, he had neither son nor daughter. 
And it came to pass, when he saw her, he rent his clothes, and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast bought me very low, and thou art one of them that trouble me, for I have opened my mouth to the Lord, and I cannot go back. And she said, My father, if thou open thy mouth to the Lord, do to me according to that which proceeded out of thy mouth, for as much the Lord hath taken vengeance for thee of thine enemies, even the children of Ammon. And she said to her father, Let this thing be done to me. Let me alone two months. I may go up, up and down the mountains and bewail my virginity, the fact she never got married. I am my fellows. And he said, Go. And he sent her away for two months, and she went with her companions and bewailed her virginity upon the mountains. And it came to pass then of two months she returned to her father, who did with her according to his vow which he did vow, and she knew no man, but she got killed before she could marry, and it was a custom in Israel, so forth and so on. Now, I got a uh, syllabus from... Uh, a teacher at uh, a famous Christian school in America about three years ago in this passage, in which he, he insisted that he didn't really kill his daughter, but he instead he sacrificed a rooster, which is a rather peculiar thing. I don't remember a rooster ever lamenting its virginity. <laughs> and, uh, and, and all that kind of stuff is, all that kind of stuff is liberal stuff barred from the National Council of Churches. Now, the idea seems to be here that since God would not approve of this thing, that he wouldn't do it, and since Jephthah was such a godly fellow, that Jephthah wouldn't do something that the Lord wouldn't uh, approve of. Now, there are about 30 things wrong with that. I'll show you a couple of them. Take your Bible and turn to Ecclesiastes. The first one is Jephthah's a hot-headed fellow and a hot-mouthed fellow, and he's opened his mouth and put his foot in it. Turn to Ecclesiastes and uh, see what he says here about uh, vowing. I'll pick up Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1. Ecclesiastes 5, 1, Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not they do evil. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God, for God is in heaven, and thou upon the earth, therefore let thy words be few. Verse 4, When thou vowest a vow to the God, defer not to pay it, for he that hath no pleasure in fools, pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it thou shouldst not vow, than thou shouldst vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. And that's what Jephthah did. His mouth caused his flesh to sin. There isn't any question about it being wrong to burn her. He shouldn't have burned her. But he certainly did. Neither say before the angel it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hands? Now the question comes up, if God didn't approve of this thing, uh, why did he allow it? Would God have held a fellow to a vow like this if he knew the vow was wrong? No, he wouldn't have. Then why did Jephthah think that he would? Because in the first place, in these days, there's no king in Israel, and every man is doing that which is right in his own eyes. You never read any place where God told Jephthah to make that vow. That was his own idea that he cooked up himself. Now you say, what could he have done about it? Now he put his foot in it. All right, turn to Leviticus chapter 5. Leviticus chapter 5. Now, these things apply to a, to a mason. And if a man is a, a mason and knows down deep in his heart, and I never fool much to talk about him, I don't know much about him. I don't think there's such an anti-Christian force as some men pretend. I don't waste a lot of time talking about them. I believe the forces of evil in this world are great more in power than the Illuminati or the Bilderbergers, the CFO, all this and that. I believe you've got a lot more to contend with than that. But you take if a man does join a secret lodge and takes a secret oath and swears by God, this, that, and the other thing, and whatever it is, and then realizes later that he made a mistake in doing it, what does he do? Well, here's what... I mean, it's in here. If you've got a King James Bible, you've got what you need. Have you noticed we haven't gone to a clearer translation yet? For, <laughs> for you know, in plainer language, for light. You know, these fellows always, these older manuscripts give light in the text. Ah, yeah, give the light in the text. Let me tell you something. You, you find a 30 of these fellows and ask to fool me up and have them show me one thing they've ever found about the Bible. I couldn't find this book here in 25 seconds. I'd like to see it. Leviticus 5, 1. And if a soul sin, like Jephthah did, and hear the voice of swearing, as the fellow made an oath and swore by God, and as a witness whereof he hath seen or known of it, if he do not utter it, then he shall bear his iniquity. 4. Or if a soul swear, pronouncing with his lips to do evil or to do good, 
whatever it be that a man shall pronounce with an oath, and it be hid from him, and was hid from Jephthah. He never got to figure out whether it was right or whether it was wrong. He just stuck by his word. When he knoweth of it, then he should be guilty in one of these, and it shall be when he should be guilty in one of these things, he shall confess that he hath sinned in this thing. That's how you take care of an oath. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. If you have passed anywhere, you've made an oath and sworn by God something that wasn't so, and you now know it wasn't so, you confess to the Lord and say, Lord, I messed up when I did that. I sinned, put it under the blood. Now, that's what Jephthah should have done. Jephthah didn't do it. You, I'll say this for Jephthah. He was a man of his word, but he was mistaken. And he did the wrong thing. There's nothing in the Bible that says God approved of it. God in those days just let them go ahead and do what they wanted to do. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Doesn't say it was right in the eyes of the Lord at all. All right. This is the end of side one. Please turn the cassette over. Oh, yeah, good. Oh, I have uh, He's a goodie. <laughs> all right, so uh, Second Chronicles chapter 22. This is the most fouled up chapter in the entire Bible. <laughs> Second Kings chapter 22. Now, this has to do with the age of a man who in one place is uh, around uh, 42 uh, years old. In another place, he's around 22. Now, for this, get in one hand, get uh, Second Chronicles uh, 22. Second Chronicles 22. And the other hand, get uh, First Kings, First Kings chapter oh, 17, 18, 19. First Kings. Second Kings. Make it Second Kings. And make it Second Kings 18, 6, over that far. It's before then, isn't it? Yeah, it's way back there in the Second Kings eight. Second Kings eight in one hand, and the second uh, Second Kings eight and Second Chronicles twenty two. Now this is a very complicated passage. I, I must confess there are about five places in the Bible that are hard to reconcile. This is one of them. But these scholars would have you think there's several thousand. It's always pulling your leg, you know. Now, there are about five of them that are real difficult. One of them has to do with where Benjamin was born. And one of them has to do with uh, the seven years and the three years of famine, the days of David. And that's a rough one. And one of them is the addition of Canaan to the list in Luke when it's not found in Genesis. One of them is the birth of Abraham when his father was 130 years old in Genesis. And one's this one right here. But outside of those five, I don't know any others that can't be answered with common sense and a little bit of Scripture. Now, this one here says this, and on the face of it, it's a direct contradiction. All right, 2 Kings 8, 26. Two and twenty years old was Ahaziah when he began to reign. And he reigned one year in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Athaliah, the daughter of Omri, king of Israel. Twenty-two years old when he began to reign, Ahaziah. Now, Second Chronicles 22, 2. Forty-two years old was Ahaziah when he began to reign. He reigned one year in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Athaliah, the daughter of Omri. Now, one says forty-two, the other says twenty-two. It's the same man. That is no, it's really rough when you consider that he's older than his father. Now, that makes it real bad. Uh, look at uh, 2 Chronicles 21, 5. And Jehoram was thirty-two years old when he began to reign. He reigned eight years in Jerusalem. Then how old was Jehoram when he died? Yeah, I will in a minute. Forty. His daddy is forty when he dies. And see, look, look at chapter 21, verse 20. 21, 20. 21, 20, and 21, 5. So there he goes. And there's other problems. Look at Second Chronicles 21, 6. He walked in the ways of the kings of Israel like as did the house of Ahab, for he had the daughter of Ahab to wife. Well, if his wife was Ahab's daughter, it couldn't have been Ahaziah's mother. In 22.2, Ahaziah's mother is Athaliah, the daughter of Omri, not Ahab. So you've got a real problem. And uh, the way that a line comes out is that Omri here. And then Omri begets a man, and his name is Ahab. 
And then over here, Ahab is daughter, Second Chronicles 21, uh, 6. Uh, the daughter of Ahab is Jehoram's wife. So Jehoram's wife is Ahab's daughter. Now, you're told in Second Chronicles 22, verse 2, that Athaliah is the daughter of Omri. Therefore, Athaliah is Ahab's sister. Now, the way all the commentators handle that thing is they insist that what it says that Ahaziah is the daughter of Ahaziah, that uh, Ahaziah, his mother, is Athaliah, that she's really the granddaughter of Omri. That is, he makes Jehoram's wife Athaliah and makes a granddaughter. It doesn't say granddaughter, it says daughter. Now, this explains why Ahaziah is older than Jehoram. His mother is Ahab's sister, Jehoram's wife down here, which means Ahaziah cannot be Jehoram's literal son. No way in the world. So that at the first drop of the hat, all the premillennial, fundamental, godly, dedicated, recognized, soul-winning fundamentalists just spit in the face of King James and threw it out the window because they wanted to maintain the contradiction. Now, let me show you how the wind blows, ladies and gentlemen. Before I was saved, well, we're not through with this thing. We've got a good ways to go yet, but you need this. <laughs> Before I was saved, I went to a church. It was St. Michael's. My priest was Father Sullivan. And one day I said to Father Sullivan, uh, here we are calling you Father and praying Hail Mary, full of grace, fruit of the loom, and all that. And I said, uh, <laughs> and then I said, over here, I said, over here, this book says, call no man on earth your father. Now, I says, the church says, call him father. The book says, don't call him father. And I says, the, the book says, one meter between God and man, a man Christ Jesus. Over here, hail Mary. This book over here says, one sacrifice forever, Hebrews 10. This one says, sacrifice Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. I said, they contradict. Oh, no, there's no contradiction between the church and the Bible. I said, what's the final authority for the church? Well, he said, the Bible and tradition. I said, yeah, but what happens when the Bible contradicts tradition? He said, oh, they don't contradict. I said, well, this one says, call no man on earth your father, and that says, call him father. And he says, well, he says, the church is to teach you the sincere milk of the word, because the church is the infallible pillar of, and ground of the truth, 1 Timothy chapter 3. I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> now, I learned something. I learned when a fellow sets up two authorities, it's so he can represent himself as the final authority. I got that one. See? I mean, that is just as solid as any law of thermodynamics you ever picked up in your life. And when you have trouble in the home, it's not because there's one authority, it's because of two of them. They say Ruckman splitting the churches, Ruckman troubling the churches. You're funny bone. You can't split a church with one authority. You've got to have two. You know a split is? Set one, you see that? Two. See him split? <laughs> that? <laughs> you, the, the, all the argument in America today is about authority. When you find trouble in the church, it's somebody claiming final authority over somebody else claiming final authority. If your pastor is the final authority in your church is the congregation, you're not going to have a church split. You're going to have a church split where somebody else rise up and says, I am. Now at home, if daddy says, I'm it, and mama says, I'm it, what do you do when they conflict? The kids are it. <laughs> the kids don't have any authority to follow. They become the final authority. You see? Now, when that says one thing and tradition says something else, then whoever decides between that and that is God, because that's the final authority and that's the final authority. Well, then the one who decides it is obviously superior to either one of them. So when I got saved, I went off to school, and I was saved for reading this book and called to preach for reading this book, and preserved by this book, and blessed by this book, and fed by this book, and if it weren't for this book, I wouldn't be in the ministry right now. And I got my clothes in my back because of this book, and the food in my stomach because of this book, and this is my book. See? I feed on it. It tastes good. Some of you think I'm crazy, don't you? That Bible says, man shall not live by bread alone, but <laughs> every word proceeded out of the mouth of God. 
Now, this is my book, see? Now, you can uh, insult my wife, my kids, or me, or my church, or my denomination. i got a sense of humor. I can take a joke with anybody else. But when you mess with this book, then I will mess with you. And so when they mess with this book, I mess with them. I have no argument against Jack Kyle's. I think he's got a good school. I send my kids up there for pastor's conference. I think they can learn something up there. I think Rice has a good paper. I tell my young men to read it. They can get good sermon materials out of it. I think Bob Jones is a good school. I recommend young people go there, a good clean university. You can get a good college education without getting dirty, see? Do you think they return the favor? <laughs> <laughs> I sell John R. Rice's books in my bookstore. You know why? I think he got some good books. Do you think he sells mine? Do you know why that is? I mean, some of you not going to like what I'm going to say. I'm going to might as well just, you know, scold you while we're here. Um, do, you know, do you know why they can't return those favors? Because they think they're so high and so mighty and so pure and so holy, they don't have to stoop to return a favor to somebody they don't like. You know why I can do that with a clear conscience and never worry about it? Because I have more grace than they have. They may be big men, but they're graceless. When they come to grace, they're babies. Amen, 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 amen. <laughs> Do you know something? If you ever get the place, <laughs> I'll get back in this in a minute, but we'll take care of Isaiah in a minute here, brother. But, you know, if you ever get the place where you can't appreciate the ministry of a brother who's doing something right for the Lord just because he doesn't agree with you along some lines, you're in rough shape, you know that? I mean, whatever Tennessee Temple is doing and Bob Jones and, and Howard Ass doing for the glory of God, praise the Lord, more power to them. If they're preaching the truth, more power to them to turn out good kids and hope to turn out a lot more. And I mean it. I mean it. Oh, Gerald Fleming said to me one time, he said, I want to have a sword of the Lord conference down here with you and Hiles and Rice. <laughs> I said, good, let's go. <laughs> and he says, you mean to tell me you wouldn't mind? I said, no, I enjoy myself. He said, wouldn't upset you? I said, why should it? He ain't going to give me ulcers. Might give somebody else ulcers. He ain't going to give me ulcers. I got a clear conscience. I never kicked a man in this country over anything except messing with that book. And if you don't mess with that book, I won't kick him. Leave him alone. So I with me. Why I'm with me. I don't care how I feel. Just leave that book alone. Now that book is my book. God gave it to me. It's mine. It's mine. All mine. <laughs> so I got this book here, see? Got that book. All right, now tradition says this one thing and the book says another. I got off this Christian school and I hadn't been there five minutes. Then this guy got up in one of those classes and said, You see the says. Irenaeus says, Cyprian says, Jerome says. And I sat there and I listened to that thing and I said, Man, I just came out of that. <laughs> I just got rid of those guys and got me a book. And now they're already correcting the book with these other guys. You know what they said? They said, That's the final authority. But the ASV is reliable. <laughs> and the new ASV is reliable. And the RV is reliable. And they're all reliable. And I said, well, what do you do when this one contradicts this one? Like, say, in 30,000 readings. Amen. Oh, that's easy. Then <clears throat> <clears throat> we'll tell you what's right. You know what they meant? They meant they thought they were God. Amen. Right. Now, do you know what my final authority is? It's right there. See? And when I say this book, I mean this one. I don't mean the one that you have in your pocket or somebody else has. I mean that one right there. See it? Right there. Right there. See? It isn't original. It isn't in Greek. It isn't a manuscript. It's a Bible. See it? Bible. Right there. Bible. Bible. <laughs> All right. Now, what these fellows do, they came to a place here in Ahazel where they saw they could leave it as a contradiction, and they left it that way so they could maintain their authority over the Word of God. Now the question comes up, what's going to do about this age thing here? Now the sun problem is no problem. I'll, I'll tell you why. In Luke chapter 3, when the Lord gives you Christ's genealogy through Mary, it begins, Jesus was as supposed, the son of Joseph, the son of Eli, and Joseph is not a son of Eli, he's a son-in-law. If you read your Bible in Matthew chapter 1, you'll find that Joseph's genealogy is in Matthew chapter 1 and goes back to Abraham. Mary's genealogy is in Luke chapter 3 and goes back to Adam. So a son-in-law can be a son. 
Now, how do you know that? Because when Saul is chasing David out there in the mountains in 1 Samuel, he says to David, Is this the voice of my son, my son, David? David wasn't his son. David was his son-in-law. Now, anybody who reads the Bible is familiar with that phenomenon. For example, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 begins, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Was David Abraham's son? Why, of course not. He was his great, 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 Fourteen generations. So often in the Bible, a grandson, a great-grandson, or a son-in-law can be called a son. So there's no problem with that there. There's also no problem in these two lines here. Obviously, there's not another line. Did you ever thought things would happen if Jehoram married Ahaziah? The woman after Ahaziah was born? If he married her, that's why he could be carried as his son, because he'd be a stepson. You see that thing? And that is all. If he married me here, he'd be married in the Omri's line as well as Ahab's line. Now, the way you know, and I'm going to show you in a minute how this thing comes out, the way you know something's all messed up in there is by the fact when you get to Matthew chapter 1 and read Christ's genealogy, Christ's genealogy comes down to Jehovah. And when it gets to Jehoram, it suddenly skips three kings and goes to Uzziah. There are three kings missing in Matthew chapter 1. Now there's something else. If you read Chronicles, you'll find after Isaiah takes over and is gone, a famous priest goes up and his name is Jehoiada. And Jehoiada is the best priest Israel ever had. He restores the monarchy to the king's son, Joash. And Jehoiada is one of the greatest priests they ever had. Did you know when you get the genealogies and Chronicles and Levi and get me the Levitical priests of genealogies, it skips Jehoiada? He's not even there. And what the Lord does after this fellow Jehoiada, right in there someplace, the Lord takes out three generations. Right there. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 20, the Lord God visiting iniquity upon the children to the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me. So you know something went all off to pieces right in there. Now there are two other factors I'm going to show you, and then these will put the pig in the poke. This fellow Jehoram, after he dies, Ahaziah takes over, and after Ahaziah takes over, his boy Joash takes over. This fellow Jehoram, by the way, is the son of a man named Jehoshaphat. Now let me show you something. Go back to Second Chronicles. Now, this is what we call serious Bible study. And the way to study the Bible seriously and labor in the Word and doctrine is, first of all, ignore all new translations. <laughs> all right, get the Second Chronicles again. Now, let's get Jehoram here. Second Chronicles 21 1. Second Chronicles 21 1. Second Chronicles 21 1. Now, Jehoshaphat slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And Jehoram his son reigned in his stead. Then there's no doubt about Jehoram. Jehoram is Jehoshaphat's son. All right, now, come to Second Chronicles chapter, uh, Second Chronicles chapter uh, 18, and take it up at verse uh, 25. Second Chronicles 18, 25. Now, in Second Chronicles 18, 25, Jehoshaphat is going out to battle. And he's going out to battle with Ahab, the king of Israel, whom he has no business going out to fight with. And when Jehoshaphat starts out to battle with Ahab, the king of Israel, Second Chronicles 18.25, we read these words. Then the king of Israel said, watch it carefully, Take ye my care, and carry him back to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son. Why, they're going out to battle here, and bless your soul, and Joash's going out to battle with Ahab. Oh, Ahab's just taking back there, and leaving with Joash, the king of them. Why? <laughs> Joash is the son of Ahaziah. Then Ahaziah is counted as a king before Jehoshaphat dies, because Jehoshaphat got back from that battle. Somebody doesn't study the Bible too close. Now, we're not through with the chip. All right, now, I don't have a, uh, I don't have a, uh, a uh, concordance here, and I'm going to have to dig in this one and get your help in finding it. But, 
And I didn't. I bought everything with me, but that book and some of them I got everything else here. No, oh, wait, they, somebody probably on the back of the Bible here. Uh, but uh, the thing is, I want a verse in, I think it's in Second Chronicles, or if it isn't in Chronicles and the King, that says Jehoshaphat is the king of Israel. Now, look around for a while and find I'll tell you where it'll be in Chronicles if you find it. If you find it, it'll be between Second Chronicles 17 and 22, if it's in Chronicles. And if it's in Kings, it'll have to be between... Uh, Eighteen, nine. No, that, that, that isn't it. I want a verse that says he's the king of Israel, which, of course, he's not. Uh, and if it's in Kings, it'll be between uh, Second Kings. No, it goes back into First Kings. Ma'am? Second Chronicles? Second Chronicles 18 what? 31. No, that's where they mistake Jehoshaphat for the king of Israel in battle, when he's not. I want a verse that says he is. Give me a few minutes and I'll find it. Now, I'll tell you why I'm trying to find this thing for you. You realize that Ahab is king of Israel and Jehoshaphat is king of Judah? And Jehoshaphat is never spoken of as the king of Israel. He's king over the... Yes, sir. First Kings 22 There, maybe that's it. First Kings what? 22 Oh, maybe. 42? No, that says Ahab, king of Israel. I want a verse that says Jehoshaphat, the king of Israel. King of Israel. That's what he is. He's king of Judah. But I found a verse that says he's the king of the northern tribes. Which he couldn't have done unless he made an alliance with Ahab. By marriage or by agreement that somebody from the northern kingdom... What is it? Yes, sir? What do you got? Second Chronicles 21-2. Second Chronicles twenty one two. There it is. That's it. Mark it. Now there's one of the wildest things you ever saw in your life. Jehoshaphat is king over the two southern tribes, Benjamin and Judah. Ahab is the king over the northern tribes called Israel. And this is the only place in the entire Bible where the king of the southern tribes is called king of the northern tribes. And it says and he had brethren, the sons of Jehoshaphat, Azariah and Jehiel, and Zechariah and Azariah, and Michael and Shephatiah. All these were sons of Jehoshaphat, king of Israel. Uh, all these were the sons of Jehoshaphat, king of Israel. See that thing? Now that isn't all. And he had brethren, the sons of Jehoshaphat, Azariah. You see that, Azariah? All right. Go to Second Chronicles chapter 22, and look in the middle of verse 6, and that's the other name for Ahaziah. Look right in the middle of verse 6. And Azariah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, went out to see Jehoram, the son of Ahab, and the destruction of Ahaziah was of God coming, by, coming to Joram. That's another name for old Ahaziah, is Azariah. But in this case, he's said to be Jehoshaphat's son. Chapter 21, 2. Now, look at verse 9. And they sought Ahaziah, and they caught him, for he was hidden in Samaria, and they brought him to Jehu. When they had brought him, they said, uh, Bury him, because, said they, he is the son of what? Jehoshaphat. Now, you know what you got there? You got a thing going where when Jehoshaphat joined the Trinity for the house that they had, they made a deal between them that if one of them died in battle, the other one was going to take over and get the other kingdom, or they're going to swap sons over those thrones. And when they did, there's some kind of a setup there between Jehoshaphat and Abelard. Now, I'm not going to press the thing all the way, but the Old Testament forbids a man and his son to come into the same woman. There. And if that took place, it explains why three generations are not slapping. If that took place. Now, 
in regard to the age he came on the throne, here what you have. You have a time going like this, and you have 42 sitting up here. You have 22 sitting back here. When he's 22, the house of that is on the throne. Back here. And Ahab is on the back here. When you get up from here, Ahab is dead and gone here. And Jehoram has been reigning up here. When Isaiah comes on. Now, the only way you can reconcile that contradiction the way it stands, the King James text, is to assume that in this one, he was 22 years old, I have read, Jehoshaphat joined the king with Ahab in Israel. That'll be in the fifth year of the reign of Jehoshaphat, and you'll find that in Chronicles. And when those two get together, they get that set up going, trying to unite those kingdoms. And when they do, they come to an agreement that if something goes wrong, that Ahaziah will take over the southern kingdoms at Jerusalem. Because Ahaziah is not in Judah's line, he's in Omri's line. He's from the northern kingdom. So undoubtedly, when Ahaziah is 22 years old, he is anointed to be king over the southern tribes, and he doesn't get on the throne until he's 42 years old. Now, if that seems stretching the point, I'll give you two cases to show you it isn't stretching anything. David was anointed king when he was a shepherd boy. You remember? Did you know he wasn't 30 till he got on the throne? Now, I'll give you a better one. Did you know Christ was anointed to be the Messiah at his baptism, and when he entered the city gates of Jerusalem three years later, they said, Blessed be Hosanna, the son of David that comes, blessed be the king and all that business. He hasn't got on the throne yet. Okay, so much for Ahaziah. Yes, sir. Yeah, well, the, the, answer that, the answer to that is, when he doesn't exercise his deity, then he has to handle things like anybody else handles them. Uh, let's see, I'll try to give an example of this. So, oh, I'm not going to find this one in five seconds. Yes. I want a, I want a verse here that says, uh, it's in the gospel. Uh, I, want a, I want a verse here to show you the delay that exists sometime between the Lord's omnipotence and his, uh, and his omniscience. And when he actually says something, uh, oh, let's see, I want a place here where he's, uh, where he's sitting around and then he figures out what they're thinking. Let me just see just a minute. I guess he's talking to the disciples. And when he perceived that they're something or other or something or other, and he got up and spoke. I don't have that marked either. No, no, it's a case where the, yeah, they're arguing about something. Yep, and uh, it's something like that, and he comes along there and says, and when he perceived that they did this, or said this, or thought this, then he said something. Luke 5, what? Luke 5. Oh, yeah, there it is, right there, Luke 5, 21. Luke 5, 21. Now, this shows you the Lord Jesus Christ is a perfect, ordinary human being of the Son of Man until he exercised his deity, and having two natures, he can exercise one or exercise the other. Now, this is perfectly apparent. I'll show you, I mean, just give you an obvious case. He's out there in the boat, and he's sleeping. Luke chapter 14, or Matthew 14, and a storm comes up. Now, what's he doing? He's sleeping. Well, let me ask you this. Does God have to rest? Does the Lord get tired? Well, of course not. But he's the son of man. His physical human body needs rest. He's sleeping. See that thing? So he gets up and he says, Peace be still. He exercises deity. All right, Luke chapter 5, verse 21. And the scribe and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sin but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, see, they didn't say that thing out loud. They thought it. And when they thought it, then he exercised his mind-reading ability and said, okay, what, why reason he in your heart? So the answer to that about the fig tree is if he wanted to exercise his deed, he could have. He didn't. One of the reasons why he walked over to it was because the disciples could go over and see the thing take place. All right, uh, you all been at it an hour and a half here. You want to call today? Take about two more and we'll wind her up. Yes, sir. Uh 
Uh huh. Well, the only way that can take you by, we turn to Romans chapter, Romans chapter uh, eleven. The only way we can answer that is saying that you can't always press a type all the way. We'll take Romans chapter 11, and Romans chapter 11, uh, look at verse uh, 23. And notice in this case here, when he talked about doctrinally about uh, Israel bearing fruit, he switched from a fig tree to an olive tree and changed trees on you. So you can't apply a type all the way. For example, if you fi- applied the cursed fig tree all the way, then uh, it's true the Jews never would be restored. But when he talks about the restoration of Israel, he switches trees on you. And he says, Romans chapter 11, verse 23, And if they, if they abide not still in unbelief, should be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if thou wert cut out of an olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature in a good olive tree, how much more shall these which be the natural branches be grafted in an olive tree? Verse 25, I would not have you ignorant brethren of this mystery, lest you be wise your own conceit, that blindness in part is happening to Israel, the fullness of the Gentiles come in, and so Israel shall be saved. Now, the answer to that thing is that they're never going to bear fruit, figs, from their national life. That fig tree was a picture of national Israel. It never was a picture of spiritual Israel. He said, Behold the fig tree and the other trees. When the summer is round, they put out their leaves. You know that summer is nigh. And that's telling you the, na- the nation of Israel, the national group, will never produce anything spiritual forever. But the spiritual root of Israel is not a fig tree, it's an olive tree, type of the Holy Spirit. And it will. Yes, sir. Yeah. All right. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll go through that. And before we go through that, let me just make one more illustration of how you cannot apply a type all the way. Uh, Christ says, uh, Christ says, my sheep hear my voice. And they know me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. On you to apply that, try to apply that sheep all the way to a Christian, and that sheep will not apply all the way to a Christian. For example, a sheep can get lost, right? Now, if you apply that doctrine to a Christian, the Christian could get lost. Let me show another one. No one, able, no one is able to pluck in my father's hand. I and my father are one. No man is able to pluck him out of my father's hand. You take that thing, John 10, and try to apply that thing all the way, you really have trouble. You know why you will? Because in this age, when you're saved, you're not in his hand. You are a part of his hand. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you're bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, and member of his member. Now, it makes a beautiful illustration. When you try to apply the thing all the way, it won't hold up. Same way with the fig tree. Now, about the changes in the King James, the question you asked. They'll always bring that up, and they bring that up uh, for a, a very good reason, a bad heart and a rotten motive. And here's why they bring it up. They're trying to, they're trying to make you think that here's the A.B. over here, and here's the new A.S.B. over here, and between this one and this one here, they've made 30,000 changes. And so the only way they can, the rascals can alibi that is say, well, look at here. What, there are 7,000 changes in several different editions of the King James? I mean, didn't one fellow have a, a, a edition there in 90, or 16, uh, 73, and another one in 1733, and another one in 1723, and one in 1830 with different changes? Yes, they did. Now, that, that is a trap for the sucker. The sucker is to take that bait. And the sucker is assumed that since there were any changes here, that it's perfectly proper to make them here. Now, we call these satanic implications, and it means that instead of stating the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, you state part of the truth. Genesis chapter 3. And when you state part of the truth, the sucker takes the trot line and gets the hook. Now, when the devil came to Eve, he didn't tell her anything that was wrong right off the bat. He said, Yea, hath God said, question the word of God. Then he said, You shall not surely die. False. In the day you eat thereof, your lives be open. Right. You'll be as gods. Right. Knowing good and evil. Right. Seventy-five percent was the truth. The devil talked to Eve, seventy-five percent was so. The twenty-five percent that's not so is enough to damn the human race. All you need is twenty-five percent. The most satanic cook lying in this world is the truth, with just a little bit of lying added to it. And when Eve looks at that tree, it's good for food, positive, pleasant to the eyes, positive, desire to make one wise, positive. There isn't one wrong thing with it, <laughs> except God said, don't do it. Amen. 
All right, now, so this is, this is the alibi that rigged, that's rigged up. Now, here's the catch. I mean, give something how funny it'd be if a fellow went to court. Suppose you took uh, Neal and Custer from Bob Jones and Ackman and Porter and Martin from Tennessee Temple and McKay and Gobbin from uh, Pensacola Christian College and then about 20 more and put them on the stand in court and made them put a hand in the Bible. <laughs> Would that be a riot? And make them swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Did you know in the courts for years that Bible was considered to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? What could be funnier than a Greek professor with his hand in the Bible saying, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, when he doesn't believe it's the whole truth and believe the stuff in there that ain't the truth? Isn't that wild? I mean, why not just put your hand on issue a Playboy, you know? <laughs> the whole truth, nothing but the truth? You might as well get your Esquire magazine news just much good. Or right, now you take this thing right here. Those changes are like this. For example, original edition of King James. For slant. That's Moses. Moffat. <laughs> Moffat purposes the fifth law. <laughs> did you ever did you ever see the did you ever see the original copy of the Constitution of the United States? That German S, see, your 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 Anglo Germanic, see, your Indo-Germanic languages. The S's are F's. You go through there and, and you know, uh, uh, I fear, I fear the prophet and the acts of the apostles. <laughs> <laughs> and so you get that F. So when they talk about changes, the first thing you've got to take, get, get rid of is the fact that about 7,000 of those uh, F's have been changed to S's. That's not the nature of those changes. Now, the next thing. Many times in the original edition, that has been changed to that, and sometimes that has been changed to that, and sometimes that has been changed to that. All right, you allow a couple hundred of those. Those are changes in punctuation. That's not the nature of those changes. They're lying to you. They'll lie every time and just lie like a dog. And if they say, Ruckman, have them take me to court and try me for size. You can prove that stuff in court. I've got an original edition of the King James Bible at home. Matter of fact, you Michiganers bought it for me. At the Youth Fellowship Camp back in 19... What was it, brother? 61 and 62? Well, somewhere back in 61 and 62, the young people of Michigan bought me a King James Bible. And that thing is this high and that wide and that thick with the original cover, the original binding, photostatic copies of all the pages with the smudge marks in the pages. So if they want to call my hand, call my hand. They know where I am. <laughs> Pensacola, Florida. <laughs> Zip code 32503. <laughs> all right, now, you take that thing right there, some of them are like that right there. Now, some of them are changed like this. For example, sometimes this soap has been changed to that. So, Sometimes like that. Sometimes this thing for, uh, all this thing for to know has come from wit or wit or what to know. And sometimes it's been left in. That's the German. This, the knowledge, to know, the this, the distance shop. Oh, and you take that stuff like this. Those are changes that is a genuine revision of one text to make it plainer. That is, that's what these professors profess to be doing themselves, which they don't do. Now, those changes there are changes not only in the English and the spelling and the punctuation, but subtracting verses, adding verses, and making 30,000 changes in the Greek and Hebrew manuscripts that Bible came from. Therefore, to compare that with that is the work of an imbecile. And you may tell your professor that's what Ruckman thinks of him the next time you see him. And it's perfectly all right if he wants to call me something just as bad. I realize that a man reaps what he sows, and if I sow that kind of language, I'll probably reap it, which is perfectly all right with me. Ta-ta. <laughs> I could care less. I could care less. So these, let me show you. We're going to close here shop for now. You've been out about almost an hour and 45 minutes now. Let me show it to me, Jelly Bean. <laughs> Take your Bible and turn to Colossians 1. Now show it to me. Colossians chapter 1. 
Now, verse 14. Now, you see that thing where it says, through his blood? Through his blood? If you don't have a King James Bible, you're not reading through his blood. Because no other Bible has it in there. Now, if you don't put it in there, you know what you're reading? You're reading, in whom we have redemption, even the forgiveness of sins. Brethren, redemption is not the forgiveness of sins. If you take out through his blood, you don't have a Bible revision. You're teaching a lie. Now, show it to me. I mean, I'm not sure you what I mean. I, if, if that's sure what I mean, then any, any sense of saying it. Is there, is there one, another one on the head? Now, I'll show you the difference in revision and, and devilment. Uh, there's the cross right there. Christ dying on the cross. All right. When Christ comes to die on the cross, take your Bible and turn to Hebrews chapter 9, Romans chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 9, Romans chapter 3. And when Christ comes to die on the cross and shed blood, he comes to shed blood for redemption. Hebrews chapter 9, to accomplish something that was never accomplished before. Get Romans chapter 3 in one hand and get uh, Hebrews chapter 9 in the other. There's an expression that occurs four times in the New Testament, and it says, for the remission of sin. And there is one time that expression occurs that it ever means in order to get your sins forgiven. Not one single time. Hebrews 9, verse 15. And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, watch it, for the redemption of the transgressions under the First Testament. Not the forgiveness. The redemption. Now, how many of you believe that God forgave Noah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Let me see your hands. How many of you don't know what I'm talking about? Raise your hand. <laughs> All right. You take Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They sinned, didn't they? Didn't Abraham lie about his wife? Didn't Isaac lie about his wife? Didn't Jacob steal his brothers? I mean, yeah, they sinned, man. I mean, Noah got pie-eyed. He got stoned. You take Abraham, you take a, a David committed adultery. Did God forgive him? Sure he forgave him. If he didn't, they'd be in hell. All right. And this was for the redemption of those transgressions. Now, verse, uh, verse uh, 22. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no what? Remission. Is that reference in verse 22 a reference to the blood of Christ? How many say yes? Let me see your hand. How many say no? Let me see your hand. No, it's not. It's a reference to bulls and goats. Now, see, in preaching, it makes beautiful preaching to say that. See, and I do say that when I preach. What's good preaching sometimes isn't too good a doctrine? Now, you lead a man to Christ, you tell him without the shedding of blood, no remission. That's perfectly right to tell him that. But in the context in which that thing occurs, look at verse 20 and 21, it's the Old Testament blood of animals. Then God did forgive them. There is remission from there to there. And if there wasn't any remission, those folks would be in hell. God forgave them. Exodus 34. Now, what I'm showing you here is that any Bible except the King James Bible has to be a devil's Bible, even if it's promoted by a soul-winning, recognized, premillennial, fundamental, godly, dedicated reprobate. <laughs> Exodus 34, Exodus 34, 7. Exodus 34, 7. You don't, you don't take the Bible because you prefer the people that like you. You take it because God put it in your lap to believe. Exodus 34, 7. Keeping mercy for thousands... Forgiving iniquity and transgression. Old Testament. There were, were by no means clear for clear. By no means clear to guilty. God could forgive him, but he couldn't clear him. He could forgive him, but he couldn't redeem him. Christ's blood is shed for redemption for the transgressions out of the first covenant. Is that thing? God had been forgiven them all along. One of the worst criticisms I get in my ministry is for, you know, they say, oh, Ruckman teaches five different plans of salvation, you know, blah, 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 all kind of business.